Welcome to Terra at Home with your host, Chris Moretti. Welcome to Terra at Home. I'm joined once again by the Terra Landscape Coach, Laura Bittner. Thanks for being with us, Laura, as Morning. always. Yep. As we're getting into the later part of the summer now, we're going to put a little bit of focus on things you can add to your perennial garden to make sure it really shines through the late summer and into the fall. Going into the late summer, it's a perfect time to plant some mm -hmm. of the, uh, the items that are really starting to come alive right now and uh, we've got a few great examples of that right here. Yes, Coreopsis is a great late season, late summer plant that gets about a foot and a half tall and wide and just has spectacular yellow flowers. And then pair that with something like the Gallardia blanket flower. Um, it just makes a real stunning combination on a lower level. Again, when we talk about landscapes, we want to start low and, and reach higher. So these are kind of a, a lower level plant that we can use. Perfect for the front of a sunny border as mm -hmm. we get into late summer. Yep, exactly. Let's move on to a group that I'm sure is uh, not unfamiliar to many of you at home and these are the cone flowers. Uh, something that's great to do with your summer border right now is choose blooms that are going to last all the way into the fall. So now we've got interest for late summer but these are going to keep blooming well into the frost. So yeah, the cone flower is not just purple anymore. You yeah. know, it's not just the standard purple coneflower or echinacea, which is its Latin name. It has come so far and you can see, I mean, look at, this is a double pink. The size and different colors and textures of these flowers are just stunning in the landscape, especially as we head on into fall. And they bloom, they bloom a long time. Look at this one, Firebird, I mean, so much interest not only in the color but in the in the shape and the way that the petals come down lime green in the landscape i love this these are relatively new additions uh cone flowers as you said laura have seen some wonderful advances in hybridization resulting in spectacular variances in shape color texture uh, and yes the lime green has never been hotter one of my absolute favorites is this new edition right here coconuts and limes. Now this one, um, again, a double flowering one which offers that big sort of puff of interest on the top with that uh, ever so hot lime green color. Yeah, and if, you're, if that's your new favorite, this is mine. This is mac and cheese. And it just, I mean, it just shines out there in the in the landscape. And, and what a fun name. What, it's a great addition to a garden, especially if you've got kids. Add yep, a little mac, mac and, and cheese. cheese. Beautiful. It I is beautiful. love the cone flowers. So you can't go wrong with this group. Echinacea, of course, they're great for a sunny border. They are native to our area, which makes them drought tolerant and easy yeah. to establish in a landscape once, uh, of course, they begin becoming established. But they are relatively low maintenance flowers. Oh, very low maintenance. And, you know, you leave them stand through the winter. For myself, I do anyway. All in the winter you have left is this interesting seed head. But it gives the birds something to eat and something to look at as well. And that goes for our next group yes. as well, which are the Rudbeckias or Black Eyed Susans. They're another one that's come a long way since just the, the black eye with yellow flower. You know, there's interesting orange tones with bronze in them, which, I mean, in fall, those are the colors that we're looking for. Definitely. And then, you know, just kind of the burgundies mixed in with the yellows. And again, the perfect seed head that you would leave through, stand through winter and then just cut back in the springtime. And really, that's all you need to do. I love it. Uh, they pair really beautiful with, um, with the echinacea, which we just talked about, yeah. but also some great other fall favorites like our next group mm -hmm. right here, which are the sedum. Um, yeah. Sedum are a wonderful su summer plant and uh, they perform well all the way through into fall and pair really beautifully with some of the other things we're talking about here. Something that I really love about the new hybrids of sedum um, is that it takes their interest to a longer period. Mm -hmm. It used to be that with a standard sort of fleshy sedum, we had to wait until fall for the flower color to really give it a major ornamental impact. Yes. But what we're getting now is really interesting foliage in a drought tolerant package that looks great from summer all the way into fall. Yep, Succul succulent leaves of the sedum help to, it to retain moisture. So again, very drought tolerant. And look at, I mean, it's just a stunning purple or a stunning variegated green and white. When the flowers open, some people say it looks like cauliflower and it's just kind of a light, light tinge to it. But as we get into fall, that is when they really shine. So 
keeping in mind things that you're planting now into further seasons of interest all the way through fall and into winter is obviously a good thing. And interesting shapes uh, like we get with sedum add interest to that fall into winter garden as well. So it's never too early to start thinking about that. Yes, and as with the, as with the others, uh, you leave sedum stand through the winter and again, it just adds a little bit of ornamental value. It won't look like this, it'll look a little brown, but it just adds something to look at through the winter. Something uh, to think about in any season really is choosing plants that offer ornamental interest not just through flower but through foliage. Like we just talked about with sedum, we've got a whole other category of plant here in the coral bells. Oh yeah. These are superstars in the landscape in any season but really look great in late summer and into fall because mm -hmm. we're not relying on a short bloom time, we're relying on this wonderful foliage that's going to keep performing all season long and this is another category that has seen some great advances in, mm -hmm. in color, variety and, and shape and texture. Yeah, and new ones are coming out all the time that just add so much more, especially used in, in a little bit of a mass planting, so threes or fives or even sevens along a border can really add impact. Something like the Midnight Rose where you've got actually two different colors, a deep burgundy and a light pink on the same plant. And I'll tell you, once fall comes and the, the fall sun hits these leaves, they just, they're iridescent almost. Um, something that I really like about this group, again, we're using foliage for color in virtually any season, but they also really perform well in a shady garden. Those areas where it's hard to get color through flower, these are your go-to. Yes, and oftentimes in the landscape coaching, that's what I tell homeowners is that we need to kind of step away a little bit from flowers and get our color through foliage when we're dealing with shade. And of course, if we're talking about color with foliage, we would be remiss if we <laughs> didn't talk about hostas. Yes. Of course, the go-to shade category that offers amazing color, texture, and shape with its leaves. Um, and of course, this is a huge category with hundreds, literally hundreds literally, of varieties yeah. to choose from. But we've got a few that are, are really spectacular. A little sunspot here. I mean, look at this perfect little plant with its yellows and dark greens and lime greens. It doesn't get very big, foot and a half tall and wide at its maturity. And then great little flower heads that come up. But you think of shade, you think of, of darker circumstances and then to add in something with this limey yellow really makes it pop. Lime yellows um, as well as, well, lime and yellow is yeah. a wonderful combination, mm -hmm. but of course hostas don't stop there. Anything no. from blues to bright greens to uh, wonderful vibrant creams and any combination thereof. So it can be a really wonderful experience to experiment with those textures and those different pairings to really make a statement with a group of hostas. Yes, of course. And I mean, leaf texture, as you said, some of them have just huge quilted leaves that again, add something to the landscape that we really can't get in a full sun garden. Of course, if you're having trouble figuring out what to put into your garden, whether summer or going into fall, the Terra Landscape Coach can help. For more information about our landscape coaching service, you can visit any one of our four store locations, or of course, go on to www.terragreenhouses.com. Thank you so much for being with us, My Laura, pleasure. as always. Join us after the break for more great tips from Terra at Home. Come and explore the new Terra, where color lives. When we first bought the house, the lawn was nothing but brown. So I called my father-in-law. You know, he's really good with the lawn. He knows exactly what to do. Well, I told him, you're Scott's turf builder. He said, well, I got this other stuff. And I told him, take it back to the store. Well, some brands have filler, like sand and gravel, stuff you don't want on your lawn. Scott's turf builder is pure food. Every granule's 100% nutrition. You get what you pay for every time. You see what happens, Tim, when you listen to your father-in-law? <laughs> All food, no filler. That's the Scots Advantage. Welcome back to Terra at Home. 
I'm now joined in the studio by Rick Lipset, who is a certified arborist and the city forester for the city of Burlington. Right. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Rick, uh, city forester, can you explain what that means? <laughs> well, basically I'm responsible for the welfare of the public trees in Burlington, from maintenance to planting, to removals. We're also heavily involved in development issues with tree saving plans. And we have another problem we're dealing with now with insect problems, an invasive insect. I understand. Ash borer. Yes, I understand. Especially in a hot, dry season, insects can really kind of explode as far as populations are concerned. And uh, emerald ash borer has sort of been a growing problem in the last uh, several years. Can you tell us about what emerald ash borer is? What What are we talking well, about? Well, it's an invasive insect that came in through. Uh, they figure through crates or uh, from the Asian areas. And uh, it, it was first discovered in, uh, in 1999 in Michigan. And they didn't know what the insect was. And then it moved on into Windsor. Then we found out about it. And we, we found out uh, more information about it. And we really had no natural controls for it. Right. But since 2002 in Windsor, it has spread gradually to tr Ottawa, uh, to it's in, um, uh, even in Quebec in some places. So what, what is happening? What, what does this insect do and, and why does it affect, um, why should Canadians care about it? Well, ash is a very popular tree. It's been planted ever since the Dutch elm disease and it's a natural growing tree in our woodlots. Uh, in Burlington we have maybe 5 to 10 percent in our uplands and 10 percent in our lowlands. And it's, uh, it's an insect that gets in there and it, it cuts off the plumbing of the tree. It, it bores into the tree and it does the serpentine galleries which choke the tree off and cut the nutrients to the tree and kills the tree. Yikes. Um, there are a lot of ash in Burlington as well as the surrounding areas. How many ash trees are planted in the Burlington area? Within our streets and our active park areas we have about 8,000 trees. Wow, okay, so that's a lot. Yes. Um, and throughout North America, as you said, ash is, is a native tree to our area. So this is a pretty big problem that's affecting basically the national canopy. It certainly is. So um, in order to combat ash borer, now, as you said, because it was an introduced insect, there aren't natural predators or a natural control for this insect. So that's part of what makes it such a big problem. Correct. Um, but I understand the city of Burlington has sort of devised a a pretty aggressive action plan and, and you're quite groundbreaking in doing so. Can you tell us about that? Well actually we were probably the first community in Ontario to have its own management plan even before we had the insect. Okay. And because we've been watching and monitoring it since 2002. Our plan is to treat all ash trees 20 centimeters and above and we're treating it with this uh, insecticide called triazine. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a natural product from the neem tree. It's from the neem seeds of the tree and it's injected into the tree and it, we have to do it every two years and so our, our purpose was to keep a balance between canopy and the character of the community because we're worried about losing uh, uh, streets especially monoculture streets which are streets which are just full of ash trees right. and so it would be pretty devastating so we're actively treating trees 20 centimeters and above Right now it's in an area around the Upper Middle Road and Guelph Line area, okay. but we're actively surveying it uh, to find out where it goes and we're, we're looking at a long-term plan with this. Wonderful. So <clears throat> this insecticide, it's injected into trees, it's a natural product as you said, how does it work? It, it, it'll affect the, first if it's injected in a tree, it'll affect the larvae, it, and if it doesn't affect the larvae when they, they, they grow through their adult period, the female fertility is reduced almost by 90 to 95 percent. Okay. So the eggs would, would not hatch. Okay, so we're looking at basically interrupting that, that insect's reproductive Th cycle and preventing it from spreading. That's correct. So we do have ash borer present in some trees, as you said, in, in Burlington, but this could be a very effective method of making sure it doesn't spread to surrounding areas. Yes, it is. Um, as far as the public is concerned, what can they do to help prevent ash borer from spreading and uh, and how can it be monitored as far as homeowners are concerned? I guess first like this this um, if I can show this this is from the Canadian Forestry or Canadian Food Inspection Agency it's uh, it's a button but don't move the firewood. Okay. Now moving firewood is the biggest problem of moving it. It's a poor flyer it can maybe do five kilometers uh, a year uh, but when you move firewood it, like you take it, you take it and you move it 300 kilometers and you've started the problem. Ah. And the public, they can look at uh, their trees, they should look at their trees and, and it's a personal thing, they should look, get a competent tree service in 
to, to look at the trees, first of all, to identify if they do have emerald ash borer. Yeah. They may not. Ash have other problems. A lot of people have misconfused the um, ash borer for because the, the trees this year, because it's been a very wet spring, it had anthracnose. Ah. And that's where the leaves curl up. Or they have ash gall. And especially with this weather we're having now, it's yeah. a drought. And yeah. there's drought conditions. So my recommendations would be to have a, a, a certified arborist, a competent company come in and assess it. Because there are other ash borers out there that don't do the damage, like the emerald ash borer. There's the red-headed ash borer and the lilac borer. But that, just to identify it and then make a, a, a commitment to what you're going to do with it. it, you have to look at when you treat the trees, you have to treat them with the triazine. You have to treat them every two years. Okay. And we, you're not sure. It may be up to two, 10 years. But the other thing we have to look at, too, is there's a cost of removing those trees and replacing them. Yeah. And, and trees had an, add another value, a hidden value, like they aesthetically do, do wonders, the property value and energy conservation. Absolutely. So for the city as a whole, um, whether it, it's trees on private property or in woodlots, as you mentioned before, I mean, they bring a great value to the community. So if trees do have to be removed, you need to replace them in mm, order to, to yes, keep that, yes. that aesthetic happening, as well as, uh, as you said, the environmental value of mm -hmm. having those trees. Mm -hmm. um, in selecting trees, should homeowners avoid picking ash? Well, pretty well ash are, they're not really a big production item anymore yeah. because people are worried about the ash and the emerald ash borer. And we haven't planted ash in our streets since 2005 on our, our uh, tree saving plant, or on our subdivisions and that. Uh, I would always would go to the garden center, go to, uh, to ask an arborist, a landscape architect, what type of tree to want yeah. in the area. Um, you have to look at the full year of the tree. You know, a lot of times you see the picture, it's got a flower on it, but the flower only lasts for one to two weeks, you know. Sure. So you have to look at it. you got to look at the soil conditions and the sun and water requirements. And choose a tree that's right for your specific that's location. Right. Yeah. As far as other general tips for making sure that all of your trees stay healthy, whether it's an ash or other trees on your property, um, what are some basic tips that people can do to make sure to keep their street trees as healthy as possible? Water. Yeah. <laughs> water is a key factor to any success in your lawn and in, in your trees. Uh, when you water, don't do a light watering, do a heavy saturated watering. And it's always subject to the soil. And I, sometimes you could even maybe have a sprinkler for up to two hours in one right. area. Let it go down nice and deep, because the roots are deep. Yes. If, you, if, you, if you give a shallow watering, the roots come up to the surface, and then you'll have a lot of trouble with surface roots. And you'll see that in lawns all the time, these roots are coming up. So nice, deep, effective watering, making sure those roots are down, down. and strong as mm -hmm. possible is Correct. one of the best things yes. you can do. Rick, thank you so much for your time and for sharing this important information with us. Uh, I very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, coming up next, some fun in the kitchen on Tara at Home. Come and explore the new Terra, where color lives. Tara at home. I'm joined once again by Barbecue Naz from Broil King. Yay! Thanks again, Naz, for joining us. <laughs> showing us some uh, great barbecue. You can keep techniques. inviting me back as many times as you want. No problem. That is okay with me. What? I like just standing back and watching and getting to enjoy your delicious food. One of these days, you're gonna have to grill for me on the grill to show me all the things that I've taught you. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna have to just cook for me and let yeah. me know what you got. Okay, you know? that's a deal. Okay. It's a deal. That's fair, right? <laughs> that is fair. What's your favorite thing to grill on? On, or cook on the grill. Cook on the grill. Yeah, you mm. always ask me, how about what do you like to yeah. cook on the grill? I love cooking steaks on the grill. Yeah? To me, there's nothing better than a, a nice steak on the grill with some, um, I love grilled asparagus too. Well, the grilled asparagus is awesome. Any any grilled vegetables, actually, broccoli is my favorite. Yeah. I love it when it gets dark and, and nice kind of burnt. Yeah, I get the burn, get the nice flavor into it. That's yeah. cool, very yeah. cool. Well, um, we're, we're cooking some vegetables on here. Uh, we are? I'm doing, uh, we're gonna do something very simple today. We're gonna do, uh, 
uh, uh, something for, for the parents and something for the kids. Okay. Uh, we're gonna start by the parents and uh, we're gonna get them, we're gonna do a quesadillas with some portobello mushrooms, some spinach and some Swiss cheese. Great. Very, very simple. Uh, we're gonna put that together. We're, we've just uh, got the portobellos mm -hmm. off, uh, or on, pardon me. We, we oiled them down, put some salt, pepper on them. Okay. And we're just gonna grill these down just so they, you know, start releasing some water on there. You get some nice markings on there. Right. Very, very simple. So they uh, get a little bit soft. Yeah, very, too. very soft. They put a little bit of salt and pepper on them. Uh, I'm grilling them direct high temperature. Okay. Uh, and this is one of those things you can cook with the lid open. You don't have to put it down. Uh -huh. uh, but we're gonna, and then we're gonna take the quesadillas after. We're gonna cut them up, put them in the quesadillas with the other ingredients and put them on the side that I have set on low. One side I have on high, one side I have on low. Okay. And that'll, that'll give me a nice finish on the quesadillas. Or you can actually use a griddle. Right. So you, I'm just want to show you. I'm gonna cook them right on the grid today, but you can also use a griddle. That gives you a nice, beautiful markings on there. Perfect. Okay. While these are cooking down, yep. I am gonna get you to do a beautiful aioli mayonnaise or okay. side di uh, dipping sauce right. for those, and that will take. Oh, okay. Very simple. It's it's about uh, half a cup of the mayonnaise. Right. Uh, we're gonna put in maybe about a quarter of a teaspoon of garlic. Okay. And about uh, two tablespoons of uh, chipotle puree pepper. Very very simple. Very. Nice. And then I'm gonna put a little bit of pepper mm. in there for you too while you're mixing it up. I love chipotle. Yeah, I'll hold this. Okay. Is that, is that well, good you like garlic? a lot of garlic, eh? Okay. Yeah, you can well, put a lot of garlic. That's good. Okay, that's good. Then the rest of that uh, chipotle puree. All of this can go in. Yep. Put that all in. That's about Spicy. two. That's about two teaspoons of it. Okay. Okay. So this is a dipping sauce, it actually isn't pretty, going right in. Pretty base, yeah, okay. pretty, pretty simple. We're going to put a little bit of pepper in there, I'm going to get you some Great. salt. There you go, and you can mix that up, not too much salt. Okay. And you can mix that up. The chipotle peppers are probably a little a little salty too, correct? Yeah, they, they've got and a nice sauce. smoky, yeah exactly, they've got a nice smoky flavor to them also. Okay, so these are ready to go. Great. What I'm going to do now, is I'm going to get you to cut these guys, I'm gonna okay. put them on the side on the side table here. I'm gonna get you a knife. Cut this them into a nice Julian size, okay? Okay. While she's doing that, oh, yeah. I'm gonna put the base oh. to our our um, uh, quesadillas together. Here. I'm gonna put some Swiss cheese on the bottom, just like that, and then a little bit of spinach right on top. I need some of those. Uh, Ooh, are hot. they hot? They are. Okay, so they let's. Are. I'll use the tongs. You use your fingers. I'll okay. use the tongs. Sounds good. <laughs> we're gonna put some of this in there. Perfect. So we're gonna put some of these guys, some of the portobellos on there, and then we're gonna put a little bit more of the Swiss cheese on top. Very simple, isn't it? Very simple. Beautiful. But they're gonna be so tasty. And when you dip them on the uh, on the mayonnaise that you made there, right. they're gonna be awesome. Now, once we we uh, put the squish them down to make them flat. Rachel, we're going to take the oil okay. and we're going to put the oil right on top of it and then put them right on the grill. Perfect. Very, very simple. All on both sides. We're going to put it on the less of the heat. We're going to put it on low. We're going to do one more. You got some of that mushrooms. You want to put the mushrooms yeah, on here I for me? Lots. I'll get another one going. One for you, one for so me. So you're putting the quesadilla right on the Right on the, on the low. You can put, yeah, right on the low side now. And when we do, when we put the quesadilla down, I'm, or on, I'm going to bring the lid down. Okay. You want to bring some of those mushrooms yeah. on there? Put it right on top of the spinach. Like that? Do you like spinach? I love spinach. Do you like mushrooms? I love I hope mushrooms. so, because that's what we're having. And cheese. <laughs> and such, cheese. Such Swiss a simple cheese. Com combination, yeah. but yeah. It, it, I, I imagine it would be very tasty. And, and you can make it your own. You don't have to use, you know, uh, uh, Swiss cheese. You can right. use any kind of cheese that melts nicely, a Gouda or a mozzarella. Uh, if you want to put uh, arugula, you know, it has a nice bite and a nice nutty flavor to it. Here you go. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to put some oil arugula on this. Arugula is one of my favorite things. Oh, I love arugula. I do pizzas on the grill, uh, just a white pizza. Mm -hmm. Then I'll take um, I'll take it off, put a coating of oil, put some arugula on it, and some prosciutto. It's the best pizza in the yeah. world. I love it. It really does have a great flavor. I eat arugula salads, just arugula, just some arugula. cherry tomatoes, maybe a little bit of um, feta cheese. And it's that. got so much flavor. Should we make another one? Yeah, let's make another. We have yeah. lots. Right? We have lots left. We'll get this last one on. Okay. Put some of those mushrooms yep. over. Lots of mushrooms. Perfect. A little bit more spinach. Okay. This looks great. Put okay. These guys on. So it's on. It's on low heat now. So we're not actually gonna have any. Grill marks on this, or, or oh, yeah, we are? you'll get the grill marks. The, the the heaviness of the grids is going to retain heat. It's going to give you beautiful, beautiful markings on there. What okay. We, what we got to do is just coat them 
and we're gonna put them on. Actually, I might be able to turn one of those just to show you the kind of markings okay. on there. I'm gonna give you the right tool. No, I'm gonna show you the right tool. The right you tool for me. the you right job. You tell me how it's done. Right over here. We're gonna take one of these guys. Let's see, see? So Large spatula. We just basically, this one should be probably, look at that. Oh, beautiful. It's almost there. Yeah. It needs just a little bit more time. We're just going to get these, we're going to put the lid down. Okay, now way, you can do the same thing on the griddle then. On the, if you want to do on the griddle, the biggest difference when you do it on the griddle, the whole the whole uh, tortilla is going to be a br uh, brown. Okay. We're here, it gives you nice lines and people like to eat with their eyes. So the nice cross hash marks on the quesadillas, it just gives it a better look. That's all. It is beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to get uh, these quesadillas cooking. Yep. How long will they take on the they grill? They won't take very long. They'll take any Anywhere from about two to three minutes Just max. Just a little bit of browning on there, the cheese melted. Very simple. That's yeah, it, right? Very simple. So and then and then after we do these, we have a little surprise for the kids, right? We do. We have yeah, so while the parents are eating their quesadilla, yeah, yeah, the yeah. kids have a, a nice treat that they can we, have. Are we gonna come back and, and show them? We are, we are. We're gonna do it right on the barbecue here. Okay. Okay, so don't miss it. Okay. Come and explore the new Terra, where color lives. The quesadillas are all ready. We're just taking them off the grill now. Yay. Now Look just at cutting them up. Look at that. <laughs> Delicious. There we Look go. Look awesome. Ooh, sorry. It's okay. I gotta be careful with this thing. Another innovative idea for the grill from barbecue now. Very simple. Excellent. Very, very simple. Very simple to do. And they look great. You put the chipotle mayo that you did, oh. put that in the middle, let these things cool down a touch. But we haven't even got to the best part yet. You know that, right? I understand we're doing something really fun now. Oh, we are. We're going to do something with, that's good for the kids, and you can get the kids involved in this one. All right. Let me just cut the last one. Okay. Ay, ay, ay. I just want to eat this. Never mind. <laughs> wow. Look at beautiful. that. Beautiful. That looks Very beautiful. Nice. Looks absolutely awesome. Okay, thank so we'll you. keep that on the side, and we're going to get now the fun part, okay? Okay. This is the fun part. We're going to do. Let me grab the ingredients here. Chocolate. We're gonna do chocolate, grilled, banana, strawberry. Exactly. We're gonna do chocolate. Everything. Chocolate grilled banana. Okay. You want bananas? You banana, keep, banana. You keep yeah, saying no the bananas. You want the bananas? I want we'll the do bananas. the bananas. Yeah. Okay. This is a very simple. Very few ingredients on this. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some again some sandwich bread here. Okay. Nice white bread. On one side of it. And again, we got to make sure that this goes down to low, medium, perfect. We're going to put one side of this, we're going to put the orange marmalade, just like that. Okay? Great. Right, we got to do a few of them because I know she's looking at me and like, I hope he's making some for me. <laughs> I don't know, we have time for a few. And on top of that, we're going to put this bittersweet chocolate. We're going to, we shave the chocolate down and we're going to put it right on top of there. Great. My hands are right like this. Oh. oh yeah. Can we can we lick our fingers on uh, live television? <laughs> I or think what? we don't have yeah? a choice, really. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna put that on here. Now what I'm gonna get you to do yep. is put just a little butter on both sides, and I'm gonna get another one going here. Okay, great. On both sides of that bread. Oh. We only have one piece left. We might have to do a half uh -oh, sandwich for fair you. Enough. We didn't expect you. We didn't know company was coming. <laughs> I'm always showing up when food's here. We're out of time, Nance, but basically all we do is butter both sides, put it yep. on the grill. Put it on the grill. It's going to toast up just like uh, you would do a grilled cheese sandwich. You put it right on the grill, low medium temperature. It's going to brown up for you. You put the lid down, you flip it over in a couple minutes. It's awesome. The kids are going to love great. it. Fantastic. Thank you, as always, for You're being welcome, here now. Guys. It's been a real pleasure. And thanks all of you for joining us. Join us next week for more fun from Tara at Home.